<laughs> there we go. Right, start again. Um, I was grateful for the meditation. I arrived with quite a lot of stress, as I expect a number of you did as well, and uh, so that's been a real gift for me tonight. My name is Kay Goldsworthy. I, um, I'm an Anglican. Some of you will perhaps have that in your history somewhere as part of your story. Some of you may have another Christian denomination as part of an earlier story in your life. And, uh, and that may or may not be, um, be a remembrance of joy for you. Um, but I hope that, uh, that as I'm with you tonight, there is uh, no, um, no sense that, uh, that this is an unhappy moment, uh, as it were, that, uh, that there is kindness for you in this space. I've been invited, um, and as she was saying, that this is, this is a series where um, you've been considering stories and people have been telling something of their own story. And so uh, that's what I've been uh, invited to do. So a bit of it's fairly pedestrian, um, as is the case with the story that we, we are and we live um, for all of us. So I'm, I'm uh, an Australian-born uh, woman. I grew up in Melbourne. I was the youngest of three children. And I, like many people of my own kind of place and age, uh, was sent off to church as a child in order to, um, as it were, learn those good things um, of faith as my family understood that. And then when I was a little older, I was sent off to another ritual rite of passage um, which confirmation, some of you may have been in that space as well. And, um, and as a 13-year-old, that was quite a step because it was a step of making another and deeper commitment um, into a faith that, that was, for me, not something that I really... Uh, of course, I didn't understand deeply. I was, I was young. But a faith which... I understood something of the heart of, even at that young age, and so gave myself to it uh, quite wholeheartedly. There was some challenge in it for me, but, uh, but giving myself into that at that kind of young age meant that it, it grew and I grew with it. And I was really fortunate because the people who were around about me in that space were people with a, a broad perspective and, uh, and generous hearts and, uh, and people who were able to hold what it was that, uh, that I might have brought as a questing and questioning teenager. Within that space, um, it was uh, a gift for me that I was taken seriously. And I think that that in the life of faith is a gift for everyone. That the sense that the who you are matters. And the who you are is taken seriously within the broad uh, faith community or faith story that you are exploring or that holds you. When I was 16, I made an inquiry about, um, about being in ministry and service, but I was told I was a little bit young and I should go away and uh, go to university and then come back. Well, I didn't go to university at all. Um, and I went away, um, <coughs> went away for a number of years, not so much from faith, but from some of the institutionalising of it, which wasn't quite at that point working for me. And I came back in my early 20s after a, a stint of working and a stint of exploration, 
came back because there was for me in the heart of this faith something which I found sturdy and trustworthy and true. And, uh, and that was about that as a human person, dignity and worth um, were a gift. They were not something that I had to earn. They were not something which, um, uh, which in any way were mine except by a gift. And that gift gave me into a perspective of what I God as as hospitality, the place of welcome. And so that uh, that story, that narrative, that theology of hospitality, has held me and nurtured me and encouraged me and and been a way in which I have. Uh, tried to also respond and live out uh, the faith that I have. Uh, a hospitality which says, because you are, you have dignity. Because you are, you are of value. Because you are, not because of what you are or what you achieve or who you are or what you have done. Because you are. And that was a huge challenge to live and to live out um, in response to others, which, uh, which you know, frankly, I do with, uh, with a limited degree of success. But that's, uh, that is an aspiration for me, the valuing of human beings because we are. And that, for me, was reflective of the God in whom I was able to believe. That was a part of the, the story of, um, of God which made that real for me, makes the faith for me come alive, be lively and be worthwhile, be worth everything really because I've given my life into that as um, you know, many of you have done in Buddhism, I expect. I, um, uh, I just happen to be in a, a group the first group of women in the country, as it turns out, who were part of the church at a time when there was a huge movement about the place of women within the life of the, of, of the church. And, uh, and I, alongside wonderful people, women and men, uh, was part of a movement uh, in the Anglican church towards women taking places of leadership that we had not taken before that had not been previously available for women. And uh, so my story is one of being part of a, a wide group uh, of people who truly saw that, um, that within, within the life of organised um, religion, within the life of Christian faith, within the Anglican uh, uh, denomination, it was not only possible but good and godly to see that tradition has to, as it were, live anew in each generation in order to live. And it's part of the word itself means that something has to be betrayed in order that it can live afresh. If, it's, if it never changes, it's just, a it's just a habit or a pattern but a tradition lives afresh. And, uh, and so that living afresh, women walking into new places of leadership within that community uh, just happens to be part of um, where I was at, at the moment that it was happening. And so, um, so that's kind of the doors that were opened. Um, for me and that I stepped through. Christianity, of course, is a narrative faith. Its, uh, its stories contain its meaning and those stories live afresh as, as good stories should. 
And so for me, some of the stories that I read, particularly within Gospels, um, are incredibly powerful. And one of those is the story of the woman who says yes. And in her saying of yes, uh, something new was born. So that's the story of Mary, who is met by an angel, who is invited to give birth. And in the giving birth of the child, Jesus, something new is born, which, uh, which holds the heart of God within it. So for me, that's a really powerful story. And her yes is incredibly powerful. And it has, been, um, it has been part of the kind of attitude, if you like, of life. How is it that we say yes to that which has the capacity to take new life within us and to be new life for those around us? And a life which is, which is I keep saying good, but actually that's a biblical word. And it really means full and possible and uh, overflowing. How is that possible? So that's been a part of an attitude that I have wanted to, um, to embody and to pursue. It isn't always easy to say yes. Surely you know that. It is not always easy to see yourself in some new way, some new space. It's not always easy to, um, to come to an understanding that, that in fact you are someone who, who is capable of saying yes to, um, to that which is new, which is presented to you, to that, that call, if you like. We use the language of vocation which comes from a word to do with a voice. And uh, that, that call, that sense that you have of being drawn further and further into the spiritual path which gives shape to your life and which you hope, by which you hope, others also might see a bigger story for themselves. A story where, not, not shadowed by shame, such an easy place for us to be, but in fact offered a new grace and hospitality, a new place of welcome, and therefore a new freedom. Um, I came to Perth, for, I was living in Melbourne, I came to Perth in 1988, quite a long time ago now as it turns out, and worked in a school as a chaplain for a number of years, and, uh, and it was a girls' school. It was lovely to be in a community for the first time in my working life in the church where I was uh, amongst women, girls and women in the main, not amongst, uh, not amongst men uh, because, of course, the leadership of the, the community I'd been in was all male uh, at one point in time. So that was a, a new experience. In 1992, the first group of women in Australia were um, ordained as priests in the Anglican Church, and it happened here in Perth, and, uh, and I happened to be part of that group as well. You know, these were quite heady times for us because, uh, because our debating was, was very um, strong and people had very strong feelings about women taking on places, um, roles of leadership like this, of stepping into places which had only been inhabited by men before. Um, the week before we were set to be ordained, there was a Supreme Court challenge, and uh, so it was not until um, four o'clock in the afternoon on the day before we were set to be ordained that the judge brought down his finding, which was that that challenge was not upheld. And so there was a huge sense of celebration. It was later in that same year that um, the barriers in the rest of the country uh, um, were, if you like, 
done away with and, uh, and in many places uh, around Australia women um, s stepped into this same role. I don't know how it is in Buddhism. I don't know how it is in your community. But when you are involved in um, seeking how it is that, that a community shapes its life, how it is that you live together, how it is that, uh, that as human beings you, you inhabit the space, how it is that you disagree or you find yourself in conflicts and you do that well, is a real challenge to the spirituality uh, that I hold and a challenge to us, um, I think, in my, part, my denomination, my tradition, to work through how it is that, um, that we can disagree and yet be held together. And I think that that's something that we have done and I certainly have done uh, with, with a mixed outcome you know there are times when uh, when the desire to be right uh, is somewhat stronger than my sense of how it is that I need to live with my sisters and brothers in community that uh, that the sense of um, how it is that I am at peace with people uh, who are so very different in the way that they respond to the Christian story from me is uh, somewhat of a challenge. And the seeking again and again of a kind of spiritual place of calm and of peace, a place of wanting to do that which the teachings of my religion speak of the quest for not only um, receiving as I require it forgiveness but actually being gracious enough to offer it as well especially when that's really really hard to do um, is a major challenge uh, in the in the very simple teaching of a spiritual path because effectively it is a spiritual teaching. It is a simple path, the path of loving, which empties itself and gives everything. That's the heartland of my faith, um, a love which gives itself away for others. That's an easy thing to say and a not-so-easy thing to do. In 2008... Um, it almost became, or it, it did become possible uh, for women to be um, ordained as bishops, which is really a, a particular place of leadership in the life of a community. And, uh, and I was invited to um, consider whether I might um, uh, take that up. And that was here in Perth again. And... Uh, and again, that story of the woman who said yes and so something new came to birth within her. And that thing which came to birth was, um, was the person who teaches about self-giving and, uh, and about embodying love was, uh, was a powerful story for me. And so, um, so I said yes and, and was um, ordained a bishop quite different from being in the groups that I had been previously. Um, I had always been alongside others when, uh, when I'd stepped into something new before that. And this, for the first time, was a step I had to take alone. I was the only person um, being ordained um, at that time. Um, and, uh, and a number of people from different faith communities came uh, to, that, to, that, uh, to that service, which was a great blessing. Later on, um, I, I worked for 10 years, uh, maybe not quite that long, maybe seven years in Perth um, in that role. 
and then went away to the other side of the country into Gippsland to become the Bishop of Gippsland, which is a lovely part of the world and was a huge blessing um, to be in really in a quite a rural part of, of Australia and to have space um, within, within that, uh, that community, really interesting space to find myself in a new place and to be able to respond to, uh, to a call. In 2018, I got called back here into Perth and, uh, and my role as Archbishop means that I am the spiritual head of Anglicans um, in Perth and, uh, and have a particular role in Western Australia. Um, I have... Uh, some of my views, some people think, are not conservative enough, that I'm a little more um, what we call liberal, which is not like the religious party liberal. It's a little more um, less conservative than, than others uh, in, my, in my understanding of the Bible and in my response to the teachings of Jesus. And that's not necessarily um, a straightforward place to be, and then, of course, there are those people who think I'm not quite um, uh, open enough. And, uh, and certainly there are people who would like me to be uh, more um, perhaps generous than they feel is that, um, that, that I am. So it's an interesting place to be as a leader to sit um, on quite a fine line and to need to be, as a bishop is called to be, um, present for everyone. And, uh, and that means having to learn even more, gen uh, uh, more generosity um, within myself, which comes not because I'm the most generous human being uh, in, in, in my church, but because there is a, there is a, a much bigger grace that uh, helps to sustain me and gives me the opportunity to learn something new about, about the generosity with which I am met as a human being and the generosity which, um, which somehow grows, expands within us uh, as we allow ourselves to be open to that. We have, in the last um, little while, in uh, we read. We're quite methodical in the way we read the Bible in the Anglican Church, and uh, and Sunday by Sunday we read short passages from the four Gospels, and in each year we spend time in one of those Gospels only: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This year is the year of Luke. And just recently we read a story of two sisters called Martha and Mary who had um, uh, their teacher and friend Jesus had come to their home. And the story, you'll, some of you will be familiar, I'm sure, remember it. The story is that Martha is busy um, preparing a meal, busy in the kitchen with a meal, and Mary is sitting at the teacher's feet. And, and Martha says to Jesus, the teacher, will you tell my sister to come and give me a hand here? Not, not in that language, but that's the gist of the story. And, uh, and Jesus says to her, looks at her and says to her, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. And Mary has chosen the better part. Now that's one of those stories in, in the Bible which is really tricky for a feminist and for a Christian feminist to read because this is a sort of story which could have two women um, put in opposition with each other. This is a story in which we could say, well, look, just being busy isn't good enough. You've got to choose the better part and here are two women to tell you that story. So one's not okay and one is. The reality is that, that within the story, the person who sits at the teacher's um, feet and learns 
is, is described as the one who chooses the better part. But what's so liberating in the story is that the posture which Mary, who sits at Jesus' feet, takes is the posture of a disciple, the posture of someone who comes to the teacher to learn. That was a posture only afforded to men. This is a story which says, you are allowed to take this space. You are allowed to sit in this place. In the language that that story is written, the words worried and distracted have at their root two separate things. Worried has, has as part, at, at root, a sense of being strangled. And um, my own experience is that when I am worried, I do feel unable to kind of move. I do feel a bit bound up. I don't know if that happens for you, but worry is the thing that you just go around and around and around in the same kind of place. And distracted has within it, um, at its root, a sense of fragmentation. And certainly for me, when I am distracted and worried, I'm both going around and around and around and I'm fragmented. You know, I use the language. I'm all over the place. I don't know where my head's at. Um, you know, I use the kind of language that, that does this. This story offers uh, an image around being able to be free from those things and coming to a place of learning from the teacher and, uh, and being allowed to inhabit that, of being able to put away the categories that others have had for you and being able to uh, be liberated into a new place. So that story has had some power for me in recent times and, uh, and I don't know how you sit at the feet of teachers, how it is that you take a posture of learning, but I hope that you are liberated into it in your own way and place. I've talked for probably half an hour and that's more than enough, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Archbishop Key. Um, so if anyone has any questions, we've got some microphones over there. I think there's a gentleman. Um, firstly, thank you, Archbishop, for your yeah. teaching. Um, the intention of my question is not to be accusatory or resentful, uh, it's, it's genuine curiosity. Um, my brothers and I had what could only be described as a hellfire of childhood. It was brutal. Um, we were shuffled off to Methodist Sunday school and then later to a Presbyterian or boys school. So it wasn't a rollicking good fun start to my spiritual life. As an eight year old <clears throat> in Sunday school, um, I prayed to God um, for some relief for myself and my brothers. Uh, that relief never eventuated. Um, as an eight-year-old, I was totally confused by that. And um, disappointed. Um, I wondered how a being, a, a God that embodies love, couldn't comfort an eight-year-old innocent. And so from that point on, I started questioning. I later on became an atheist. 
Um, but then I studied and science and practiced science. And as a scientist, I believe that you can't be an atheist. You, you have to be an agnostic because you don't, you just don't know. So I remain agnostic. Um, I'm agnostic about some aspects of Buddhism as well. Um, so why did God ignore me? Why did God allow an eight-year-old child to suffer? I'm so, oh, I know that's a pointy question, but... I think that the, the question of suffering is one that we know is universal and that the particular, your particular story of suffering as a child, you know only as an adult, is one that many children have and still experience. The issue around innocent suffering um, is one that I think we find questioned, I find questioned in the pages of the Bible. So people questioning God about why is it that I suffer, where are you and where is the relief? And you and I both know that it is often the case that that prayer is not answered in the way, or perhaps is not answered at all. It'd be stupid for me to say, isn't answered in the way that you sought it to be answered. I actually think that's not quite good enough as an answer, but wasn't answered. And still somehow for you, agnostic is how you're able to describe yourself. That there is something beyond bigger. Within that and within your humanity, I would hope, I really do hope, that there is the possibility for you to be able to see where both the guilt and the shame should reside. Because what I do know is it wasn't you. And human beings are not always great. I hope for a better way, a much better way of being able to speak of that which I call God, that which is beyond, and to reflect that in the way that it's lived. I'm sure that's not going to a deal because those things that you've merely hinted at are profound and they touch the very, very essence of us. Um, I th it Zionism um, has clearly in some ways been, I would think, a kind of gift to you working through and working with. So I don't know if that was church or if that was more intimate community for you. Um, if, it was, if it was the church community or a more intimate familial community in which, um, uh, which wasn't great, but that was, that was not you. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Archbishop. Um, that really opened my heart too, because I was brought up as a fundamental Catholic and yeah, my sister tried to commit suicide because it was so terrible. And um, yeah, there was a lot of self-hatred, but I was very, very religious. I loved Jesus so much I wanted to show the stigmata for Jesus to suffer. And then the self-hatred was so great that um, I kept having car accidents and I... But then what happened, I found meditation through um, the Anglican Church, through um, David Prescott. Mm. That started and I was always interested, I was always with yoga, always. I loved the divine in mm -hmm. the yoga and the union, the nature. And then I, I found um, the Eastern religions and then I've come back and I realised that this self-hatred transformed to love for all religions, for all beings, for all nature. And so I am so blessed that that beginning transformed me into the universal mind of all things, of oneness. And um, yeah, I'm so grateful you're here tonight. Thank you. I'm glad you found that space. Thank you for the talk tonight. Hello. I'm, I'm raised Catholic too. And since I moved here to Australia, uh, things are different about Christianity for me. And I, I want to ask you one question. Uh, how do you keep believing in God? I mean, like, after I learned a few things about history, I come to the realization about nonsense about God. I mean, like, I believe that everyone believes in something, spiritual things that we don't know for sure the beginning of the life. It's science still try to find out. But like, I rise from the little kid up to now, I find it, I, f I feel being so stupid all this time. So it's hard for me now to come back. I'm still going to church every Sunday, but it's like I'm going through the motion. Like, anchor for me for my spirituality now is to Buddhism. I'm going to church out of habit because they're the place where I feel I belong. But every Sunday on church, I'm like, how do I keep believing in this? It's a, it's a very strong conflict within me. Like when I learned about karma, that actually no one can escape from the effect of every cause from your mind, from your talk, from your action. And in Christianity, there is forgiveness of sins. Sins, which is, if we talk about that, it's also like karma, but bad karma, how I understand that. So I come to realization, this forgiveness of sin actually is nonsense. That's how, yesterday when I read it, I feel like it's very stupid for me to, to believe this all this time. I feel like being lied to, and now I'm struggling. How do I keep believing in God? So I still pray, but I don't believe. <laughs> and I find it's really hard, really hard, because I raised Catholic, the church where I placed, that is the place where I go, there where I met all my friends, and all of a sudden, I feel like it's all lies. Then, especially about God. Like, but... Also come to realization about Buddhism, 
in some part of it, it's hard for me to keep it because it's like very self-responsible way. That's how I understand Buddhism. You take care of yourself, self-responsible. But we also come to understanding that our self is very limited. We all gonna die. We don't have the power. We have we, somebody else. We 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 are not the great that we are. You know, like rely on ourselves. I find it struggle also for me to rely on myself, but I find it struggle for me also to rely on God, which I believe is a little bit like illusion. So how, how do you, as a, in this modern age, how do you keep believing in God? I find it's really hard. I find it's really hard. So I'm, all my friends in church, like, they don't understand me, but I read the history, and I find it, oh, I find it really hard to, to believe that all this time I'm being stupid. That's how I feel sometimes. But sometimes I come to Buddhism and feel like, no, this is, cannot be right. I'm not that great. We shouldn't be just, we should thankful to something bigger than us. But it's hard for me to say to God. So how do you how do you keep yourself mm -hmm. about all of these things? Like you believe in God and all of these things. Yeah, um, I clearly you're on, on. I mean, there's a big journey for you in this. You, if you're you're in two kind of spaces around around things, and and my own experience is is different from yours, obviously, and yours from mine. Um, I do have a faith. I do believe in God. And the way that I live that and, and follow that and, and uh, believe that is, for me, uh, an ongoing journey. It is, uh, it is a continuing, going, um, I would call it interior journey. You know, the travelling in about faith, traveling into the heart of, uh, of the teaching of, of, my, of, of Christianity. And, uh, and it is always, there is about being responsible about the way in which I do that. So I'm probably not going to be at all useful for you as you, as you struggle this because um, my, my wrestling and your wrestling are are two separate kinds of things, I think. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, my wrestling is within how I understand my faith and live it, and, uh, and you, we each as individuals have to work through the way that we, um, that we find ourselves. And, and within Buddhism, I think that many people would possibly use the language of salvation differently, but, but that which has brought the peace and, uh, and opportunity for living, and um, and that that in my in, in Christian faith is about just working that out, in uh, working that out quietly and day by day, uh, you know. Sort of, there is a scripture which talks about doing it in fear and trembling, and I don't mean fear as in being afraid, but but in that that moment of wisdom, when you understand that that in the face of the universe. And it was actually in the meditation as we began tonight um, uh, that that in it wasn't said like this, but this is how I heard it. In the face of of the universe, we are tiny things, and yet we we are here and we are present, and we we have meaning. And uh, so, I mean, I think as you are struggling with this meaning, um, may uh, may all goodness be with you. Are you reading the Dalai Lama and um, and uh, is that um, uh, the South African? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I thought that's what that was. So um, Desmond Tutu, you, that might be that might be a a book where the dialogue um, between the two and the uh, the conversation partners that they are 
in that book of joy is, uh, is of use. I hope it is. Thank you, Archbishop. Hi. Um, hello. Um, I don't actually have a question. I, um, I have a lot inside. I can't quite verbalise it. But have you ever heard of um, Joel Goldsmith? Of? Joel Goldsmith, a Christian mystic from No, long I don't ago? think so. Okay. Um, because uh, I think the only question... Hang on. Um, I listen to a lot of his work... Um, which is God's used often a lot, all the time, and, and the interpretation of what God is. And I, I, I suppose I'm ask, what I could ask you is, how do you define God besides that, um, as you said earlier, that in, you were talking about the integrity of just we are... Is there anything more you can say that might... Yeah enlighten how you how your uh, ministry defines yeah. God so the the scripture if you like says God is love um, and yet uh, there are so many words for God so many titles for God and some of them have been used in ways that have been terribly oppressive and some of them have been used by colonizers we know this we live this we're we're in that and uh, and some of them have been uh, words that have been wonderfully, wonderfully freeing. I was, um, I was out near, I, I go on retreat out bush about in, in between Southern Cross and Kalgoorlie um, every now and again and I was out there and uh, with some Aboriginal people a few weeks ago and, you know, I'm useless at working out the stars but finally I kind of got the Southern Cross and... Um, and uh, one of the men was saying that, that in his community, Christianity began to make sense when they saw that this star in the sky, which had actually been part of a story, um, talked about the kind of payback and the, the taking on uh, those things which, which had been um, payback that other people had, had had to carry, that had been the burdens that, that people had had to carry. And so I love that sense of, of that cross sitting there as a sort of, you know, because it's a pointer, it's a guide, it says who we are. It's a whole new way of, um, of engaging with a, with a name for God and, um, and a title, if you like, but there are so very many. And... Uh, and the, the language we use reflects something of what it is we, we believe. So I have some different ways in which I speak, um, uh, as it were. So that, that language of Lord and Father and um, Almighty, I mean, that's very strong kind of language and it's not always been useful. But, um, you know, but I think beloved and, uh, and friend and uh, um, giver of grace. You know, these, these are other languages and people use a wider language. I hope that answers the question to some degree or yes, begins does. the conversation. Yeah, thanks. I would like to um, say more, but I do have to go because I look after an elderly person, my mother. Um, but just, I just wanted to say it's more, like you said, it's an inward journey of God um, externalising itself, correct? That's that's what you're saying, yeah, and that's the spiritual path that well, you live out. Yeah, yeah, but but um, I suppose I see that uh, what it, when I hear people talk about God, I feel they externalise it as something that has to help them, rather than it coming from within them. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Anyway, I have to go. So, yeah. but thank you very very much. Okay. And uh, are you available to chat at yeah, sure. other times? And things like that? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Eddie, Eddie has to give a comment. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Archbishop K. Hello. Yeah, thanks for coming here to give us a talk, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not a question. This one is like to share, you know, on Buddhist God. Share on. On Buddhist God. In Buddhism, there is God. Mm -hmm. There's different, you know, okay, there's God in Buddhism, yeah. If you ref refer to the 31 planes of existence, you know, that we have, okay, starting for all these hell realms, animals, okay, we human beings, we are on the fifth realm, human beings, okay. On the seventh realm, is, there's a realm called the, the realm of the 33 gods. There are 33 gods, okay, yeah. And then the, the thing is, in fact, they are not gods, they call it gods, they are like angels, you know, the three, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then higher than that, the next one is the ninth realm. Mm -hmm. There's a Tusita heaven, there's a god realm. They say that the, fu the future Buddha is coming, waiting there from that realm, you know, heaven realm, okay, yeah. Then um, 11th realm, that's the um, realm of Mara, he's the lord of, you know, of sensual pleasures. Then the, the real high Buddhist god is on the 14th plane, you know. The great Brahma. But the Buddhist, this great Brahma, he is not the creator God. Alright? And below the 14th, there are ministers, they are, they are like sons of God, you know. Okay? So in Buddhism, okay, the Buddha tells us, okay, there is this God realm, this thing, but he asks us to not rely on, on the high powers, you know, to rely on yourself inside thing, you know. It's like you're saying, the kingdom of heaven lies within. In, in a, I can see the similarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you work from inside the thing. You, you, yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, yeah, if you really look um, closely, you know, more deeply, you know, there's a lot of similarity, you know. Similarity, you know. Yeah, I was thinking like Great Brahma before he's he's far away. He can't help us. But in Buddhism, the devas, you know, like a six, seven, eight planes, they can come to help practitioners if you if you are really sincere and you sort of you ask for the help, they can help you. Thank you. I think I'm learning things ah, there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, th no, no. That's uh, you're teaching me some things about Buddhism oh. that I, I don't I don't know. It's just so, sharing. Okay. Yeah. By saying this, I'm not trying to put down on other religions, no, 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 but no, not no. at all. That's not in me. It's no. just sharing. Yep, thank yeah. you, I appreciate thank you. that yeah. very much. Yeah. And that kingdom of, of heaven within... Um, yeah, that's it's within, a, it's that's similar thing, similar yeah. yeah. Kind the of Buddha language. says, everything lies within this fathom long body, inside us all. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, so I was raised a Catholic, so I'm familiar. Sorry? I was raised a Catholic, so I'm familiar uh, with their need, ways. You need the Catholic Archbishop, you guys. <laughs> no, but I, I'm just curious... <laughs> I'm just curious as like what um, the major differences between Anglican and Catholicism are. Between Anglicanism and and Catholicism. And Catholicism. Oh, okay. So um, Anglicans don't have a pope. Uh, so the there is we're we've a very different um, po polity uh, uh, organisationally. So um, there is no pope. Our clergy are allowed to marry. They don't have to be um, celibate. And um, uh, 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 um, are the teachings the same? Uh, there, there are many similarities, and there are some things that would be distinct. So there would be a different emphasis um, uh, in that the Catholic Church teaches in its doctrine. There. And, uh, and, and distinct differences um, between the two. So, so really the Anglican Church came about in the, 16, in the 16th century. It, it was a split um, between uh, uh, the Catholic Church and the Church, the Catholic Church in England, and the, um, the, the king became, if you like, the sort of head of the church in England. And that went through a period of, there was a period of reformation and, um, um, and that was a really significant, uh, brought sweeping changes with it. And, um, and Anglicanism has kind of always sat in that place of being, having that history of a bit of reform, breaking away, but also some similarities. But there are some teachings that are very different and um, and there are some things that that are similar. 
So you still believe in um, Jesus Christ and yes. the Holy Spirit and yep, the Yes, yep. so Father. that Trinitarian formula of God as, as a creator and as um, Christ and spirit, yes. Mm. So is there any teachings that are very different from Catholicism that you could give an example of? Um, well, I think the teaching on women um, being able to be priests is very different. So that's that's certainly not um, not allowed in the Catholic Church. Um, that um, uh, you know we don't have a Vatican um, uh, teachings. I mean the official teachings of the Catholic Church to do with moral issues, like um, I guess like birth control and or, or, or um, uh, some of those sorts of issues I mean, um, yep they're they're teaching on things like divorce and remarriage I mean I think there's a bit of a breach between the teaching and the practice in some ways but but that's and I can't really speak for the Catholic Church because I'm not part of the Catholic Church yeah no worries I was just curious thank you you're welcome Thank you, Archbishop. I think we <laughs> kept you long enough on a Friday night. <laughs> um, I was really inspired by your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, yeah, that there's a lot of similarities between sort of the teachings here and like the warmth and the kindness and the compassion you extend. So thank you very much once You're again welcome. for your time. And uh, we hope we can invite you again soon. <laughs> thank you, Anusha. Thank That's you. very kind of you. you. I um, I really appreciate your welcome and uh, and the the grace that you've you've given like nine o'clock still here and <laughs> and that's that's really lovely of you I am I'm really aware that um, that Buddhism I think and I think meditation has been a space in which people for whom organized religion organized Christian religion um, that that when that has not been a good space this kind of space has been healing and um, and welcoming and and a place where people have been able to reconnect, if you like, and uh, and I'm very aware of that and very aware of the um, the uh, the things that have come to light in the last few years through those issues in the Royal Commission, and uh, that has just been absolutely absolutely shocking. And it should never, ever, ever have been part of the story of a um, of a religion that speaks of its heart as love. But there it is; it has been. And uh, so, I am aware that wherever I go, um, I meet people who may well have been um, hurt, worse than hurt in some way through the actions of somebody who is part of a church um, of, of their, their history. So uh, I hope that my presence has not for you been too painful if you are one of those, um, those people. And, uh, and I, I do want to say that, I mean, I can't speak for any other church but my own, but, um, but I am so very sorry if that has ever been your experience. Okay, thanks.